Um, who is here? Just you and me and Zach? No, we have Ann Greenfield, we have Ali Sheva, we have uh, Heather and Jerry, we have uh, Someone else? Not sure who that was. Maybe Naomi. I'm not sure. I can't see. Oh, oh, hello. Hello. Hi. Okay. Hello. Hi, Jesse. If you want hello. to see everybody at once, you could uh, put on gallery. It's on the top right corner. There's like nine squares with each other, and that shows you everybody at once. Uh, if you'd like to look at yourself best, you can go over your own thing and over the three dots, put pin video, uh, and that's you always look at the Okay. Uh, people are still signing in. We can give it a moment or two. Okay. Hello, Jerry. Hello, Hi, Rabbi. If, uh, who, Jerry and Heather, the two of you can't be on in the same room at the same time. You're going to get feedback. So one of you should just mute yourself if you'd like, and then uh, you'll be fine. Bye. Bye. I can also, I can mute you as well. Yeah, sad news about Rabbi Morgan. Eh? Rabbi. Yeah, I'm going to mention it now. How do I mute? Okay. I I can mute everybody. If you'd like, I can mute everybody. What I'm going to actually do is I'm going to mute everybody. And then when you want to talk, just press the space bar and it, it will let you talk. It will let you speak. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Okay. So I'm going to mute everybody here, I think. I don't have a space bar. <laughs> oh. yeah. Hover over the bottom. I won't talk. All right. I'll unmute you, Zach. Don't worry. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can always raise your hand. There's a little button there on the bottom uh, that says reactions. And if you click on it, you could give me a thumbs up if you like what I'm saying. Or you can raise your hand if you want to get my attention. Or you can always chat over here and just say uh, hi. Like over there, all right? Okay, so let's begin. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. The first thing I want to mention is uh, unfortunately, um, there's a very tragic uh death in the community today uh, rabbi morgan who many of us at the kahila know because he used to daven with us he used to come teach for us in the mornings he would teach a uh, gemara shir for a number of people at the shul and for, for a number of years maybe five six ten years i don't know the exact number uh, others went to hear his shir at link and on, he's been sick with the coronavirus and unfortunately and sadly he uh, passed away today so we should hopefully this shir will be lili nishmaso and his neshama shahavan aliyah if anybody wants to uh, say anything, you could press your space bar and it will let you, it'll let you talk and you're welcome to do that. Okay. All right. So let's begin. The first thing I want to, the first point that I want to make tonight is uh, a very important, uh, a, a very important point. I think it's a very important point. That's why I'm sharing it with you, which is, which is simply this. What, what's the goal of the Seder night? That's my question. What's the goal of the Seder night? And that's obviously a question everybody, you know, has their own perspective on. And uh, I think there's two aspects to it. There are the technical goals of the mitzvot, which is, for example, you want to do the mitzvot of the day. What do I mean by the mitzvot of the day? You have matzah, you have murar, you have, uh, uh, you have, uh, uh, there's matzah and there's murr, there's telling over the story, ideally, hopefully, in the best case scenario to your children, if they're there. There are different mitzvot, right? Phyllis is saying to tell the story. That's certainly the goal. So there's the technical mitzvot. And then they also, I also have what we call, what, I, what I'm labeling for tonight, for lack of a better term, even though really it really is one of the technical mitzvot, where the Haggadah itself tells us, that a person is obligated to see themselves as if they themselves have left Egypt, which means that it's not something historical. It's not something in the past. It's not something, it's not just sharing, uh, you know, uh, uh, tales of a Jewish history lesson. That's not the point of the Seder, but rather it's a person somehow or another through the mitzvot of the day, of the Seder itself, through the telling over of the story, a person is supposed to get to a point where they're experiencing what it's like to be a slave and what it's like to be free. And, and imagine themselves having gone free. So that by the time they get to the end of the Seder, 
and they're saying hallel. It's a personal expression of thanksgiving to Hashem. And that's really the goal. And, that's, and that is a goal that's not just a technical goal. Obviously, the technical goals are important, and it's what are important. But that's, a, that's the spiritual goal, or that's the holistic goal. That's really what we're going for on Seder night. So I wanted to share with you something that I saw over Shabbos, because I think it's something that will give us a bit of a framework for how to go about doing this. Rav Shimon Schwab was a, a Gadol by Yisrael. He was a Rav in Baltimore for 20 years. He was a rabbi in Breuer's in, um, in Washington Heights for a number of years. Uh, and he was a, it was a German Jew who uh, made his way, I can't remember if it was after the war or before the war, he made his way to Baltimore, to the United States, and then to Washington Heights. Rav Shimon Schwab has a sefer on Chumash called Ma'ayan, Beis HaShoeva, I think it's called. That's on the Chumash, which is very, very popular. And he also has a commentary on the Siddur, which is available in English from Art Scroll. It's also extremely popular. Rabbi Schwab on the Siddur, it's called. So the Schwab table, their Shabbat table, their table on the Chagim was filled with guests, including Gedoli Israel, important Jewish leaders, prominent intellectuals, poor people, simple people. And the conversation was adult. And the children listened in. And they learned their father's personal history. They learned about his various stances on questions of Jewish thought, on communal issues of the day. But the time, and, and when he had guests over, he wouldn't always necessarily put his children right next to him. He would often put his children, you know, put the guests first and then put the children after the guests. And that was true most of the time. However, at the Pesach Seder, he made a special point to address his children. Seder night, he'd place the children at the head and he made an announcement. He says, I apologize to the guests, but tonight I'm addressing myself to the children. They're the object of the Seder, the Garda Lebencha. Now, obviously, the elephant in the room here is that many of us, unfortunately, will not have our children at the Seder this year. We won't be with our parents this year. We're going to have a very different kind of a Seder. So that aspect of the Garda Lebencha, of teaching your children, is not there in that sense. Although Zach had a wonderful idea, which is that you can learn something between now and Pesach, and you can write it up. And you can share it with your children, with your grandchildren, and you give them, you know, the message from Bubby, the message from Zadie, from Grandma, from Grandpa. And it's a message that you want them to read at their Seder, so at least you have a shliach, in a sense, you'll have an, you'll have an agent, which will be your, your children will be the agents, or somebody at the table will be the agents of sharing the, um, the message that you want to share. And uh, the, in the article here that I, that I read on Shabbos, they, it, it mentions that there was one Seder in particular that seared into Rabbi Meir Schwab's memory. Some of you know who Rabbi Meir Schwab is. Rabbi Meir Schwab is, I think, is the principal of Beis Yaakov of Denver, one of the original popular Beis Yaakovs here in this country. My aunt went there, probably in the 70s, I imagine, something like that. Late 60s and 70s, my aunt was there. And it was a popular destination because it was the only Beis Yaakov at the time that had a dormitory. So for girls who lived in uh, far-flung places, meaning anywhere outside of New York, they only, the only real Beis Yaakov option for them outside of New York was in Denver. So, uh, Rav Schwab said, or Mayor Schwab says about his father that it was sometime after the second cup of wine. And, um, and some of the children were already a little giddy, laughing a bit more than the sublime nature the night warranted. He turned very serious, recalls Rav Mayor. He grabbed hold of his kittel and he said, in this kittel they will bury me. Tonight I'm here to tell you that this story is no myth, no legend, it really happened. If it were the last day of my life, I would tell you the story because it is emes, because it is the truth. And it became a very solemn moment, and he returned to his very jovial self after having put the fear of God into us. That's a memory that his son shared. And to me, it just kind of jumped out at me as being maybe the framework that we're looking for, that we're searching for, regardless of whether or not our children are there. I'm not referring to the, the, sol the solemn moment aspect of it, but rather I'm referring to a different aspect of it. He said, Tonight I'm here to tell you the story is no myth, no legend. It really happened. How's that for a framework? How's that for a way to look at the Seder? To know that the purpose of tonight is not just to read it like you read Ashray in the Seder. The purpose of it is not just to read it like you read a novel, God forbid. But the purpose of it is to share truth. And when you're sharing truth, when you're bearing witness, when it's something that's so important to you, then that's something that is, is so powerful. And it's, it becomes first person. It becomes real. It becomes, it's become something that you can connect to. And that's, um, and, and I think that perhaps, perhaps 
that's a framework that we can go for. In other words, I'm telling the story, but I'm not just telling a story. I'm sharing my experience with you. Many years ago, I, I heard a, uh, an idea from a rabbi, a Chabad rabbi in the Bay Area. He lives in San Jose. He's uh, one of the top uh, mashkichim for the OU. And I, I apologize, I can't remember his name offhand. Um, but he, he said, I once asked him, how do you tell a story? Because he was a great storyteller. And he said, the best way to tell a story is you close your eyes and you picture the scene. And then all you're doing when you tell the story is you're describing the scene to the people because you're the only one who can see it and they can't. So you literally are drawing a picture for them using your words and you're teaching them and you're showing them. You're showing them. You're, 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 that's what storytelling is. That's the key to storytelling. Details, description. You know, for many years, uh, uh, Ruvi, I see your question. I'm going to get to a little bit later, okay? Uh, for many years, I would spend time, I, I, I would spend time at the Seder uh, really focusing on that aspect of, um, really focusing on that aspect. Thank you, Joel. Really focusing on that, on that aspect of, of the Seder. You know, we, we, how do we begin the Seder? In the beginning, our grandfathers, our forefathers were idol worshippers. Well, that's one way to begin. Another way to begin the Seder is, We were slaves to Paro in Egypt. So in order to understand that, first you have to understand what is a slave? What is a slave mentality? What, is a, what does a slave look like? What kind of freedom of choice does he have? Uh, I heard from Rabbi Dr. Pelkowitz recently, uh, quoting Rav Charlap in his Agoda Meimoram, which is actually our primary source for tonight, where he, speaks, where he says that slaves don't have the power of speech. They don't have freedom of speech. It's not just they don't have freedom of speech where they could protest and they could, they could uh, put on hafkana, they could, they could uh, they can strike or they can say what they want, they can print what they want. No, it's, mu it's much more than that. They're too exhausted. They're too caught up in, in, in survival. They're, they're living constantly in some sort of a, in a crisis mode. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So that they, they don't have the power of speech. It's not that they don't have the freedom of speech, but rather they don't have the power to speak. And what is the purpose of Seder night? It's Haggadah, it's speech. Because that's the ultimate expression of freedom. The ultimate expression of freedom is to, to speak, to share, to tell, to gather together, and to, to, uh, to have that freedom. And not just the freedom, like I said, but to actually have that power. So that's, that's something that I used to focus on. What, is, what does an Evid look like? I remember when I was in seventh grade, I'm pretty sure my teacher in Torah Sabbath got in trouble for this. Um, he showed us an old television show called Roots. You may uh, remember it. And you can YouTube it. You could just type in Roots. Kunta Kunta, or Kunta Kunte. Joel, you probably can know the name exactly. Um, and and, uh, and there they ask him, they ask him there was, he was a slave. He had just been captured, obviously. He was fictional, but they had just been captured and brought to the United States, and he was sold as a slave. And his, and his owner gave him a new name. I don't remember exactly what the name was. Let's say it was John. And, uh, and, he, and they, they hung him up by his arms and um, off the ground, and they asked him, what's your name? And he said, Kunta Kunte. And then they whipped him every time, until finally at the end, you know, he, had, he, he, he said what they wanted to hear, which was, my name is John. Taking away, stripping him of his identity. That, I think, for us, perhaps some of us, uh, some of us for, for some of us, that's an image of slavery that we can kind of relate to, because it's something that we've seen often enough, at least on a screen. Um, obviously, there's other kinds of slavery, even nowadays. Uh, but I don't know that you necessarily want to get into that at your Seder. Okay, so let's take a look at, um, at, at, the, at the Haggadah itself. We're not going to cover everything tonight, uh, but we're going to cover a couple important and interesting points. The starting point of, of the Haggadah that I want to mention tonight is Kiddush. Kiddush. When, when's the last time you went to a Seder, a Shir about the Seder, and heard something about Kiddush? But if you read the Kiddush carefully, there's something very powerful over there. And this speaks again to the truth and to that it's not a legend, it's not a myth, and it's not just Jewish history, but it's actually relevant even today. And it's about our relationship with Hashem. So if you look at the Kiddush, the Kiddush says the words that we say all the time. What are those words? And we say this in davening as well. Asher bachar banu mikolam. God chose us from amongst the nations of the world. V'romimanu mikol lashon. And he lifted us up from every tongue. The commentaries say that means that he gave us Lashon Kodesh, which is God's language, the Holy Tongue. 
the Kiddushan of the mitzvah of and he sanctified us with his mitzvahs. These, this is three phrases that we're familiar with. We say them all the time. We say them on Shabbat. We say them on the Chagiyah. We call them, God chose us from amongst the nations of the world. And he sanctified us through his mitzvot. This yesod, this foundation that God shows us is one that is, is, a, is a pivotal and, and important and fundamental uh, foundation of the Seder. There's a very interesting Pasuk in Yechezko. The Pasuk in Ezekiel says, um, I will be the God. And they shall be my people. I will be their God and they shall be my people. So Rav Charlap, and that's the, that's the Haggadah that I used in preparing for tonight's class. Rav Charlap was, I think, one of the principal students of Rav Kook in uh, Eretz Yisrael in the 1920s and 30s. So he says something which I found to be fascinating. Prior to Hashem choosing us as a nation, the Jews were like any other nation around. However, Hashem chose us. What do we say in the Haggadah? <laughs> Originally, we were idol worshippers. And that's really a reference to Terach, to Abraham's father. And now, God brought us close to his avoda. Again, this is what we say in the Haggadah itself. Originally, we were, originally we were what? Originally we were uh, over the Avodah Zara, we worshipped idols, and then God brought us close to his service. What is our praise? What's our glory? What gives us our identity? Our Jewish identity, the fact that Hashem chose us. Hashem had tremendous chesed, tremendous kindness, and he did us a tremendous favor. He chose us from amongst the nations of the world. God chose us from amongst the nations of the world. That is the greatest chesed that God ever did for us, was that he chose us. Asher bachar banu, that God chose us. Mikolam. He could have chosen any, any nation to be his people, and yet he chose us. There's a beautiful pasuk in Devarim, and I want to share the series of Pesukim with you. And for this, I'll share my screen with you so you can look at it inside while I read it. In a moment, you'll be able to see my screen. Uh, you'll see my notes over here. Okay. So this is in Deuteronomy chapter four. If anybody wants these notes, you don't have to write everything down tonight, Zach. I'm happy to share my notes with you. Obviously, what I say and what the notes I'll give you, will be, the two together will be the full share. So this is in chapter four of Devarim, where Moshe Rabbeinu is giving a history lesson, if you will, to the Jewish people. But he's also establishing their connection and their relationship with Hashem. He says like this. You have but to inquire about bygone ages that came before you. From the time that God created a man on earth. From one hand of the heavens to the other end of the heaven. Has anything as grand as this ever happened? Or has its like ever been shown? So here he's setting the stage. Here he's setting the stage for Jewish history. What happened? Those of you just joining, this is HaKadosh Baruch Hu. This is Hashem who is choosing the, the Jewish nation. And that's what we're talking about in Kiddush. Hashem Bochar Bonu Mikolam. Hashem Ha'om Kololokim. Has any people heard the voice of a God? Midaber mitoch ha'ish kasher shamata atav ha'yechi. Has any people ever heard the voice of a God speaking out of a fire as you have and survived? Obviously, that's a reference to Matan Torah, to the giving of the Torah. And here's our, here's our critical Pasuk. Oh, Elokim, has any God ventured to go? To take for himself one nation from the midst of another nation. With tremendous miracles. Signs and portents, meaning that they are predicted by Moshe Rabbeinu. Uve Melchama, through war. Uve Yad Chazaka of Israel Natuya. This is obviously something that we talk about at the Seder. With God's mighty hand and the outstretched arm. Uve Moraim Gedolim, with awesome power. 
Like any like everything that Hashem did for you before your very eyes. Ata Haresaladas Ki Hashem Huelokin Eno Novado has been clearly demonstrated to you that Hashem alone is God. There is none beside him. Meaning the Egyptians, they said, oh, we have our gods. And they said, our gods are going to compete with your God. And obviously, obviously, there's no competition, nothing to talk about. Because he loved your fathers, it's a reference to Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, he chose their heirs after them. He himself and his great might led you out of Egypt. For what purpose? To drive from your path nations greater, more populous than you. To take you into their land, to assign it to you as a heritage, as is still the case. Know therefore this day, and keep in mind, that Hashem alone is God in heaven. That should sound familiar to us. We say that in Aleinu. And therefore, that Hashem alone is God everywhere on, in, in the universe. Therefore, therefore, I want you to keep Hashem's mitzvot, that which I'm commanding you today. That which will benefit you, your children after you. That will give you a richat yamin, that will help you live a meaningful life. That Hashem has given you for all time. These psukim are awesome. These psukim are essentially a, a beautiful summary of that which we're speaking about. Hashem choosing us as his nation. Says Rav Charlap. Says Rav Charlap. When we say Kiddush, what we're saying is Hashem chose us from among the other nations of the world. Hashem lifted us up. Hashem gave our lives meaning. Hashem gave our lives purpose. And it's through his mitzvot that we connect to him. And that's what the Kiddush is saying. And that's, and that's what our emuna is. And that's what our faith is. It's not something that's just a story about something that happened way back then. I remember uh, many years ago, I'm, my mother sitting uh, across, far across the table from me here. And uh, she's my aud- live audience of one in addition to the 20 or so that we have here. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. I remember many years ago, my grandparents, my paternal grandparents, Bobby Lee, she, for Hanukkah, she got us these books. I think it was for Hanukkah. She brought us these books. They were Bible tales by uh, Hannah Barbera. Do you remember that? And, uh, and it was kind of... Um... <laughs> My mother says she must have thrown them away. But I remember reading them. I was like, Samson and Delilah and Rebecca and Jacob, you know, etc. And, uh, and uh, you know, it's, it, it was like... It's just, I remember saying like, you know, even back then, it just didn't sit right with me. Why didn't it sit right with me? Because it took Tanakh and it turned it into a comic. It took Tanakh, it took Jewish history, not Jewish history. It took the foundations of Judaism and turned it into a comic. Now, I'm not saying there are different ways of, of course, there are many ways of, of teaching Torah. Um, but I just, I remember even at the time that it didn't sit particularly well with me, even though I was a child. I was like, no, this is not the Torah that I'm learning in school. Now, obviously, she meant well. Uh, but but it just it, there was something that, that I found very very strange. When we're giving over the story of of Yitzhiat Mitzrayim of the Exodus from Egypt and Hashem choosing us as His nation, we're not we're not channeling Hanna Barbera. We're sharing. We're, it's not a it's not a it's not a fairy tale. It's not a myth or a legend of old. It's a fact. It's part of our history, but it's part of our present. It's our reality. It's our connection to God. And that's, and that's the goal for the night, is so it's real. That's the framework. That's what we're going for, to be as real as possible. And I think that's the idea that Rav Charlap is saying. So Joel has a question. Joel's question is, don't we say this Kiddush for every Shabbos in Yantif, or the Shalosh Regalim, for the three holidays? Go, yeah, we do. Especially Shalosh Regalim, Asher Bochad Mikalim. We do say it by all the Shalosh Regalim. That's because it's all real. That's because it's real. Um, and, and I... I Obviously, um, obviously, um, sorry, I'm distracted by Myrna's question. Myrna, if you want to explain yourself a little more clearly, I, I, I can send him a message. Uh, you, you, may be able, you may also be able to send him a message privately too. You can try that. Um, obviously, um, 
Pesach is Pesach, Sukkot is Sukkot, and Shavuot is Shavuot. Each one has their own messages. But in terms of understanding that message and, how, and its relevance to the Seder, that's really what we're going for tonight. Okay? So that's step number one. The, the fascinating thing here, and, and this is the takeaway, is Hashem started the process here. We didn't start the process. Hashem is the one who started the process of us being his people. It's true. He chose us because he loved the forefathers and they started the process on their end. But with regard to, um, with regard to the Jewish people as a nation, while we were in Egypt, we were not successful. The majority of the people were of Zara, they worshiped idols. So why did God choose us? He, cho- he chose us. It wasn't that we chose him. Yeah, it's true. At Matan Torah later on, he asks us, do we want the Torah? And we accept it. So yeah, because it's a relationship. There's a give and there's a take. But, but the starting point of that relationship is Hashem himself chose us. And that's something to be mindful of. Because again, what is, the, one, of, what is one of the primary themes? We've spoken about this many, many times in the past for the Seder. For the Seder sheet. One of the most important themes of the Seder is, is the Muna of Hashem. It's, it's coming to believe in Hashem. And you do that through, the, through, tell, through telling the story. We're going to go to Halach Ma'anya. Halach Ma'anya is uh, uh, one of the openings of the Seder, of the Haggah, of the Haggadah, of Magid. And um, uh, if, you have a, uh, if you have it open in front of you, you're welcome to look at it. I'm going to, I'll share some of my screen for a moment, just so you can see the language here. Okay. Halach Ma'anya diachalu avasana ba'ara de Mitzrayim. This bread, Anya, we'll leave the word Anya untranslated for a moment. If you know the translation, you can put it into the chat if you like. The Achalu Avasana that our forefathers ate. Where did they eat it? Ba'ara de Mitzrayim, in the land of Egypt. Now, if I were to ask you a question, the first time the Jews ate matzah was when? You can press the space bar and unmute yourself if you'd like to. When is the first time the Jewish people ate matzah? Most people would say, yeah, it's written in Aramaic, thank you, Joel. Most people would say the first time the Jewish people ate matzah is when they didn't have time for the bread to rise. Isn't that right? You can just nod along if you think that's true. But we didn't read that. We just said something very different now. The halach ma'anya, this is the bread of anya that our forefathers ate, but ara de Mitzrayim, in the land of Egypt. Kol dichon yesev yechal, anybody who wants to should come and eat. Kol dichon yesev yivsach, anybody who needs should come and share the carbon Pesach with us. Hashtahacha or Hashta Avdi, the Shana Babane Chorin, I don't have the whole language here. Now we are servants, but the year, in the coming years will be free. Hashta um, Hacha, this year we're here, the Shana the Aradi Israel, next year we'll be in Israel. So this is obviously one of the most famous quotes from the Haggadah, from the Seder. So, first of all, what does Anya mean? What is Matzah? If I were to say matzah, what kind of connotation does it lend? Is there is a connotation of the bread of affliction, which is what lachma anya means, or does halachma anya, or or is there a refer- when I say matzah, does that remind you of freedom? So is matzah the bread of slavery, or is matzah the bread of freedom? The answer is yes, it's both. It's both the bread of freedom and the bread of slavery. Why is it the bread of slavery? So if Harlap says something that I never saw before, I always assumed it was the bread of slavery because the Jewish people in Egypt didn't have time for bread to rise because they were slaves. And how much time did they have to spend cooking? So they mixed a little flour, a little water, water, water together, and then they baked it. So they had matzah. By the way, just parenthetically, especially if you're, uh, you know, the Yemenites, their matzah is kind of like a, a pita-like or a lafa. It's not unlikely that the Jewish people in Mitzrayim ate that kind of bread. That's Middle Eastern bread for thousands of years. Yeah, you know, they have these ovens, Afghani ovens that they make the lafa in. But again, they're not eating, you know, big challahs like us, uh, like, like Europeans. So, so the first, so I always thought that, that that's why it's called lachma anya, the bread of affliction, because they didn't have time for it to rise properly. But if Charlap says something very different. Okay. Um, Harlap says this is the bread they gave the Jews in Egypt why? because if you want a slave to stay a slave keep him hungry it's when people start to feel still full feel full when people begin to feel full 
that's when their mind becomes a little bit more free. And that's when they start to have rebellious thoughts. So the systematic slavery that the Egyptians had to keep the, uh, to keep the Jewish people enslaved, part of it was to deprive them of food, to deprive them of nourishment. I was recently reading something about this, you know, the Civil War, um, the Civil War era. It was a book about Civil War era, and there was a description of the, uh, they weren't slave laborers, they were paid, but they were basically foreigners who were working on the railroads at the time. And they suffered terribly from scurvy because they, 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 they didn't have enough fruits and vegetables because the people that were uh, manning the budgets, if you will, for, uh, for, for, the tra- for the train workers, you know, they tried to get off as cheaply as possible. When, when you're trying to maintain order, in this case, it backfired on them. Obviously, they weren't healthy. But in, in Mitzrayim, they were trying to maintain order and keep the people enslaved. Says Rav Charlap, that's why they gave them the matzah, the lachem oni. That's what the Torah refers to it. It's De- Deuteronomy 16.3, Devarim Perk Tazayin Pasuk Gimel, where the Torah refers to matzah as lachem oni. So that's the first connotation with matzah. The second connotation is one that we're much more familiar with. They didn't have time for the bread to rise when they left Mitzrayim. And since they didn't have time to rise when they left Egypt, obviously leavening only happens when one tarries. So listen to this uh, incredible idea from Rav Chalap. There's two, there are two interesting, I think it's two interesting things here. In order for matzah to become chametz, in order for flour that comes into contact with water to become chametz, what is the key ingredient? What's the key ingredient? The key ingredient is time. If you sit around and do nothing, after the, the flour comes into contact with the, with the water, it automatically becomes chametz after 18 minutes. Automatically becomes chametz after 18 minutes. What's the key ingredient? The key ingredient is time. Time is what makes flour and water into chametz. Time is a commodity. We know that. Time is the only thing that you can never get back. Time is a commodity. Time is something that has extreme value. To be a master, a mistress, to be in charge of your own time is to be free. To not have time. To have somebody else telling you what to do, when to do. Without, and make someone else making your own schedule for you. That's not being free. You know, one of the reasons why kids love, love the summertime, at least the first couple of weeks of summertime until they get bored, is because all of a sudden they're masters over their own time. When they're in school, they're told exactly what to do, when to do, and how to do. But time, is, time has that aspect of freedom to it. There's obviously a correlation here between time and being free. That's, my, that's kind of my, my addition here. If Harlap says it a little bit differently. There's something called Zman and something called Lamala Minazman. Zman means you're bound by time. Lamala Minazman means you're not bound by time. To be above time, to rule over time, so time doesn't rule you. The truth is, I'm not sure exactly what Rav Chaylap is saying, but let me, uh, this is how I understand what he's saying. In, in Halacha, there are different examples of it. I'm not gonna go into the one that's kind of the most obvious. It's not necessarily appropriate for right now. But let's put it this way. If, um, if a child is born in uh, Nisan, okay? The seventh of Nisan, let's call it. So the child is born on the seventh of Nisan. And then the child turns uh, 12 years old. Okay? So he's how many months are left to his bar mitzvah? 12 months. What happens if on the fourth of Nisan, I don't know if it can happen that way, so let's say on the 29th of Adar, the based in the Sanhedrin decides to add a month to the calendar year to guarantee that Pesach falls out in the spring and, and Sukkot falls out in the fall. What if they did that? How many months will he have to wait between his 12th birthday and his 13th birthday? 13. That's being a master of time, where, where, they, where we dictate time rather than time dictates to us. Says Rav Charlap, 
chimutz, chametz, comes because of tarrying, because of delaying, because of waiting. When the Jewish people left Mitzrayim, even though they left in a hurry, but ultimately that freedom is, is expressed through the fact that they become the masters of time. You ever hear the expression, um, he's got all the time in the world? When, when is that usually used? There's a certain fellow who uh, I have to, I have to, I call him every once in a while. And then what my expression about him, I don't share this with anybody, I would never tell you who it is, is, he's got all the time in the world. Why? What do I mean by that? You all know what I mean by that. Talks and he talks and he talks and he talks. He's got all the time in the world. He's got all the time in the world. So what is matzah? What does the Gemara Pesachim teach us about matzah? Lechem, it's bread. She'onin alav dvarim harbe that you can, you can have all the time in the world and talk and talk and talk, that you say many things about it. She'onin alav dvarim harbe, you respond, you answer. There are many, many words that are said over the matzah. So it's true, we're eating matzah, which is not, which is flat, which is not chametz, but what's the idea? We're choosing, obviously Hashem tells us to eat matzah. What's the idea? The idea is that while we're avadim, while we're slaves, we're still very much stuck within time. However, and that's why we say, halach ma'anya, listen carefully, here's where it all comes together. Halach ma'anya, that bread of affliction that our forefathers ate in Mitzrayim. Hashta avdi, now we're slaves. Let's put those two sentences together. Meaning, before we, before we reach the level that we're going for, before we reach the level we're going for, while we're still slaves, while we're in this process during the Seder of experiencing what it means to be a slave, right now matzah is lacham oni. It's lacham anya. Which kind, of, which kind of lechem anya? It's, it's, it's lechem anya, it's the poor man's bread that our forefathers ate in Egypt. And therefore we say, now we are slaves. Those two sentences go together. However, what do we say at the end after we talked about, um, uh, after, after, what do we say at the end of the paragraph? Lashana haba b'nei chorin. Next year we're free. Then we're going to really be masters of time. And that's when the Kedusha, the sanctity of the Matzah, which is not bound by a framework of time. And then it becomes not Lechem Anya, but Lechem Oni. Not the poor man's bread, but rather the bread over which many things are said. As long as we are slaves, we're not yet above time, we're satiated with the initial reason that this is the bread of our forefathers that they ate in Egypt when they were slaves. Next year, though, we're B'nei Chorin, when we're free. At that point, we're above time. And that, at that point, the Matzah becomes Lechem Oni. So therefore we say, um, those two senses go together. But then we say, the goal here is to become free. That's the goal of the Seder night. And at that point, the matzah becomes the, the bread over we each, over, we, over which we speak a lot because we're in charge of our, of our time. That is, this is the, the idea, the primary idea that I wanted to share with you. I mean, among, obviously it fits into our miskeret. It fits into our framework. But what is our framework here? What was our goal here exactly? Our goal here was, was simply this. Our goal here was simply this. This is truth. We're not storytelling. Yeah, we're storytelling in the context of let's get into the detail. It's much more than that. It's much more than that. It's not just storytelling something that was. It's not a myth. It's not a legend. It's not, just, it's not a Hanna-Barbera cartoon. This is life. This is real. This is MS. This is, this is our story. And this is when Hashem chose us to be his people. And then of course, the end is, what does it mean to be Hashem's people? It's to do Hashem's mitzvot and to connect him in a meaningful way. If anybody has any questions, I, I will unmute you. I thank you so much for joining us tonight. A very nice crowd, Baruch Hashem. It was really a pleasure to see everybody. Some new people, some people that have participated before. It's possible the next Sunday night will continue. It depends on what's going on in the world at that time. And I, again, I thank you so much for joining us. Anybody have any questions, questions? You can raise your hand by pressing on reaction on the bottom of your screen there. And uh, I'll get a notice that you're raising your hand. Uh, otherwise, you. Uh, Rabbi? Yes, go ahead, Jerry. Um, Rabbi, I have a question. You know, from a kid until relatively recently, I understood that the plague were there to punish the Egyptians. And then I read uh, that the plague in effect, were there almost yeah. equally to teach the Egyptians that their gods were meaningless and that our, our God had all the power. Mm -hmm. Could you not argue 
picking up with where you started, Mr. could you not argue that teaching the Egyptians, they, the plagues taught the, the Israelites the power of Hashem so that when he chose them, they understood exactly the strength and the power of the God that he had. Hey there, well, that's for my time. Could you not argue that way? Could you not argue anyway. that uh, the plagues also taught the Israelites the power of Hashem mm -hmm. so that when he chose them as the, as the chosen people, they understood just how powerful the, 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 our God was and just who they had protecting them. It's, actually, it's, it's actually a pasuk. The Pasuk says that the Makos are, the Makos are referred to by the Navi as Nigo Virifo, which means that it actually has a double, this double-edged uh, nature to it. I'm going to see if I could find you the source quickly. But Nigo Virifo, what does Nigo Virifo mean? Nigo Virifo means that um, exactly the point that you're making, which is, yeah, it was a nega. It was makos. It was it was plagues against the uh, uh, the Egyptians, punishing them. Absolutely, a hundred percent. On the other hand, how did Hashem choose to uh, how did Hashem choose to punish them by demonstrating His mastery over creation? If you look carefully at at the, at the makos, I, I've, I've shared this in the past. But if you look carefully at the makos, it's a fascinating thing, which is. Dam uh, kinim arov. So dam is blood, kinim is lice, which is made from the sand. Arov is uh, wild animals. Dever is a plague that affects the domesticated animals. Uh, Shechin are boils that affect the people. It's made from ash. If you think about etc. etc. Right? The arbab is here, locust. If you think about every the whole hierarchy of creation, from the dirt and the water to the skies to gases and oxygen to uh, to um, uh, amphibians to to insects to to wild domestic animals, wild animals, people, you name it, vegetation. Every single bit of, uh, of, of creation is, is manipulated and modified by the creator. If Hashem was only about choosing the, to, to punish the Egyptians, he could have done so in many ways. He could have brought a flood. He could have done you know, all kinds of things he could have done. But how did Hashem choose to punish the Egyptians? Specifically by utilizing his, his, his master of creation. And that's... Uh, and that and that's something that again that's that's that idea for sure that's that idea this this is true on many many love many deep levels but that's a short answer the short answer is yes i agree with you 100 percent. and that's and again that's one of the goals of the seder night is about amuna is to teach our children to remind ourselves that we believe that hashem is in charge of the world go ahead uh, uh rabbi uh on your halachma uh, which is very good i thought by the way. thank you um, you said at the beginning it's lechem oni, and then you said at the end it's lechem something else. What did lechem sheonin alav dvarim harbe, bread over which uh, you say many things. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I think that's Linda. Is that Linda? I'm not sure who that is. I just texted you privately. Yeah. Did you want to ask something? Yeah. Go ahead. I can. Is your microphone working? Because I don't hear you. Talk, Linda. Talk. You can also text it to me if you like. Her microphone is off. Okay, your microphone is on. Speak. Say hello, Linda. No. Okay, it, it's, it doesn't matter. I, I texted her privately. She's welcome to respond by text message. If anybody else has any other comments or questions, um, Jobana Soto, don't know if you're pronouncing your name correctly. Thank you for joining us. Samantha B, thanks for joining us. And uh, 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 Ellie Moshe, David's mom. Lisa, thank you so much for joining us. Go ahead, Clark, you have a question? Or are you just giving me a round of applause? <laughs> giving you a round of applause. Oh, thank you very much, Clark. Okay, um, I wish you all a wonderful night.
uh, you're welcome to reach out to me to ask anything you may, you may like to ask. Uh, we'll, we will, uh, Tuesday night is another lecture, but that's on mental health and, this, and the uh, situation. And you're all welcome to join that as well. Okay, thanks for coming. Lila, thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank bye. you. Bye.